Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the bar. I am your humble host. Today we have another amazing guest. They keep piling up. Today is absolutely no different. She is an IFBB pro. She's a certified nutrition coach. We're going to talk all about it. We're going to hear this journey. We're going to hear how this started. We are going to talk until she's her ears bleed and she's sick of hearing me. Please give a welcome to the bar. IB, IB, IFBB pro Liz Curtis. Hey, everybody. <laughs> how are you on this fine Friday? Oh, amazing. It's um, it's a good day. I live here in Phoenix. It's our weather is amazing right now. It's kind of like 72 and sunny, so I can't complain. It's 46 and sunny in Chicago here, and it is, I mean, it's beautiful. At 40, and 46, I mean, like no jacket, shorts, we're nuts here. I mean, I don't know. Phoenix, I would love to do that. I, I haven't been back in a long time. I mean, that, that's yeah. perfect for you guys. It's fall time. That's really, they, we have a little thing. They call them snowbirds over here and they come from Chicago actually. Um, but yeah, it, there's a huge, huge Chicago base out here. Um, they come here when it's super cold over there yeah. and then they hang out for a while. And we're, we're accustomed to it. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I'm I was just saying really anymore because everybody's moving here. Like between, I bet like November and March, there's like an influx of people in your town. <laughs> Yeah, I used to work in the restaurant business, and that was actually something we prepared for was the increase in business during that time That's and the decrease in business during summertime, which is flipped in other areas like San Diego, where I worked similarly, yeah. um, where summertime is your busiest time and wintertime is your um, slow days. Isn't that weird? It's just, uh, but you know what? San Diego has my heart. I mean, I, nothing against Phoenix. I, listen, I'm all about 75 and sunny every day. <laughs> and San Diego is a good place to go. Um, I think you could live there, but I don't know if you can grow there because it's just almost, there's just no challenge. <laughs> there's yeah. not enough food there for you to struggle with, for you to grow. So it's there, a good place for retirement. It is like a perfect spot. It's expensive. It's pricey there. Um, yeah. you know, the homes are not <laughs> cheap. The in Phoenix. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, you get the, you get more heat obviously in Phoenix, but like San Diego, like, especially if you're near the water, forget it. You're paying, you're paying a ton. Well, I mean, to be honest with you, I moved here in um, 2017 okay. and everybody, all my friends were telling me, why are you going to Phoenix? I'm originally from Bakersfield, California. Okay. The climate there is almost identical to Phoenix. Phoenix is just a little hotter. Yeah. And like, why are you going there? There's nothing out there. You don't know anybody out there. And I was like, I don't know. I feel like I'm being called to something out there. I'm just going to go. Um, but blessing in disguise, I didn't have to deal with COVID in California. Ooh, good point. Mm-hmm. Good point. So you guys have been kind of, you guys have been like under like the radar out there, like just do your own thing, no masks, like whatever. Yeah, pretty much. Um, we were pretty strict for maybe the first six months or so. Yeah, but um, I do remember the first thirty days was creepy. It looked like yeah. uh, like Mad Max, like no, nobody on the street. Just, everybody was just like, "What is it? What's going on?" Yeah. But I think that we just don't care enough here to <laughs> like we, we take our health <laughs> into account. And something about the people here. People here can be more just down to earth, I think. Yeah. And so they, kind of, they don't get caught up in a lot of the hype. Now, not saying that that doesn't exist here because it totally does. Totally does. But the area that I tend to stick around in, I feel like I meet a lot of like-minded people. And it wasn't as bad as I think some other states had it. Yeah. Well, I mean, here it was bad. I mean, listen, when COVID hit and people were still going into like the city, the expressways were like, it was like Mad Max. It was like, this is usually an hour to get downtown. I can get down there in 35 minutes. It was crazy. Yeah, we had a couple clients that were from Chicago and it was scary for a little bit because some of the stuff that was going on over there, they were like, they had to go home in the middle of a lot of riots Yeah, and they were going to visit family. And I was like, dang, man, that's so scary because, you know, us as Americans, we don't really take into account what that kind of fear is like every day. Right. Everybody else in the world generally has to live with it, but yep. it's just for us, we feel like, wait a minute, that doesn't exist here. It absolutely does. It just doesn't exist because they haven't pushed us this far yet. Yeah. And that's the, that's, you know, listen, we can go into this about, you know, it's leadership here in the state and that's, that's how it starts and whatever his morals are, we all kind of yeah. follow along. For the most part, though, I think it's just important that everybody take into account their own personal mental health during everything. Totally. And that's kind of like my beacon in this. Like, I don't care 
what you put your energy into so long as it gives you light and happiness. Yeah. And if I think if everybody focused on that every day, there'd be a whole lot less hate in this world, be a whole lot less anger because you wouldn't have time for it. You'd be so yeah. excited. Yeah, like, you're right about that. How my day is today. I'm amazing. I'm glowing. I've been doing a lot of self-reflection. Some amazing things have happened to me this week because I kept my heart open. And yeah, there could be a lot of bad things happening in my life, but it's outweighed by all of the amazing things that are like life changing. I would venture, I don't even know where to unpack. You've said like five things that like, I'd like, okay, remember that, remember that, remember that, go back to that. So this upbeat, I don't, and people that are watching and listening, Liz and I met five minutes and 40 seconds ago, officially like on the phone. So I, I, I don't know you very well at all. So, but my thought is, is you were not always this way. Right. There was a journey. OK, there was a journey. There's something that happened along the way. Maybe not one thing, but several things that just sort of open your heart up. So how did it's where'd you where, where, you're from Bakersfield. So how what, what was growing up like for you? Ooh, that's a deep question. <laughs> um, whew, how do I start this? Well, I, I guess what I would start with is what people would expect a normal childhood would be like. And I find a fallacy in that idea because I think it helps. Well, it doesn't help. It actually forces a lot of us to believe that we're not normal. Right. Um, because there's an idea of what your childhood should be like. White picket yeah. fence, mom and dad, all these crap, whatever. Nobody's childhood is like this. So let's just be clear. I'm not special in this way. It's just that I've learned to recognize it. Um. So I have a really small family. Uh, it's just, I have my dad. I lost my mom when I was 10, which is kind of the point of that, of this whole childhood story. Um, and I have a half sister uh, from my mom side. Okay. Now she got diagnosed when I was seven years old and she battled it for about two to three years and she passed away when I was 10. That alone is a hard thing to deal with. If that yes. were the only thing that we had to deal with. Um, but it wasn't. Um, we were poor, like really bad. <laughs> the house we lived in is so it, it's so like, it's hard. to. I'm going to have to channel this down into a simple line. So it's understandable. Sure. The, the land that my dad lives on is the land that my family bought when they immigrated from France back in 1880s. The house that he lives in is the house that my grandfather built. that was supposed to have been the back house to the bigger mansion up front. If they ever got money, they didn't. But it's all built from scrap wood because he was a carpenter. And back long time ago when he was like putting up doorways in hospitals, like he helped build the hospitals in Bakersfield and all of those things. If there were scrap and nowadays they'd never do that. But back then oh. they're like, whatever. He would bring it home and he built his house out of it. And so that's where my dad lives. Wow. Well, until this last month, he sold the land finally. And that actually changed, it kind of changed a lot of things in my life, but that's, that's in the future. We're back in the past right now. So a lot of the other things we had poverty, we definitely had, you know, like our rent was $300 a month and that was expensive for us. And we paid it to his mom, like my, my grandmother. The other major tragedy in our life was that my sister, my poor sister, her real father um, sexually assaulted her from infancy until she was 12. Mm -hmm. So if we put those timelines together, her timeline and my timeline had a massive amount of pain, loss, um, insecurity, abandonment, all of those things that just compounded on the two of us at a very young age um, because we were so poor. Sorry, I don't have my cats over here. <laughs> <laughs> it was okay. Yeah, yeah. We'll get, I'm sure they'll, they'll say hi at some point. Awesome. Um, so because we were poor, I, I always felt like there was no family around for us to support. So that's another aspect. When I talk about this dynamic, my mom is an only child. My dad is an only child. So there's no aunts. There's no uncles. There's no cousins. They had aunts and uncles, um, but they were so far distant from us that right. we had two twin aunts that came over and showed me at seven how to change the dressing on my mom's um, external catheter. And I don't know if you've ever know what that looks like, if anybody's familiar with what that looks like, but it is a giant hole in their yeah. stomach where you're pulling pussy gauze out, cleaning blood, cleaning with alcohol, rebandaging, repackaging, and taping. Gosh. Seven years old, eight years old, nine years old, and 10 years old. It's funny because nowadays I weigh my food, I do low salt, I do all these things. 
But when you're on chemotherapy and radiation, you're on low, no, little to no salt. You have to weigh all your carbohydrates because you can't have any inflammation. And that's what I was doing at seven, eight, and nine years old was weighing her food and catering to, and being her nurse oh. every day. And it was frustrating for me that that was something that I had to do. I didn't realize it was frustrating for me because I had compassion and I was just, I loved my mom. Yeah, yeah. Later on, it built resentment for, from me, in within me. And then after she passed away, there was a big amount of confusion between my sister and I because her being six years older, unfortunately, that was not the only situation that she had to deal with in terms of sexual assault. It just became a pattern for her. Um, and then the first opportunity that she got to leave the house, because clearly her dynamic with my dad wasn't great at the time, right? No. Her, you know, vision of a male energy in her life was yeah. terrifying. Yeah, right. I, mean, I remember one time she cracked my dad's ribs shoving up against a, a van. And it's like, I understand that anger now. I don't feel like I'm upset at them for either one of those situations. I just see it. And I'm like, man, that was rough. So anyways, she left and uh, moved up to Visalia and we didn't talk. And I kind of felt like, what the fuck can you left me behind? I'm sitting here all by myself. I, I started my period on my own. There were some tampons in the bottom that she had left behind. that were like a month old. I pulled out the instructions. I'm like, all right, I guess this is it. Never had oh. those times, never had those conversations, never had those like moments with your parents where they teach you things because my dad and I at that point were roommates. He, I started working at 16 because I needed money for things. I would get into the fall and I'd say, Hey, dad, I need money for clothes. And he would be like, Here you go and give me $20. It's not even jeans. But I couldn't sit there and tell my dad that because he wore Goodwill hand me downs. Yeah. And he was a penis. He came home smelling like oil. All of his shirts had holes in them. Like, I'm not going to tell my dad I need more money for that. So I went out and made my own. And, you know, the high school years, or pretty much any delinquent high school years story that you could possibly think of, except for I found a way to kind of diversify those things. In school, I was a straight A student. School was easy for me. It was never something that was challenging to study. I just absorbed. I was like, it makes sense. It's fine. I'll just do it. Yeah. With the ambition and excitement to actually engage and learn and be prepared for a future, just died in high school. I got into drugs. I got into people that I shouldn't have been around, but I would only do that on the weekends. So on the weekend, I'd have my <laughs> party time. Monday through Friday, I was barely passing high school. I barely graduated. Retarded because I'm so intelligent and I know so many things and I was doing great. I just didn't go to class because I didn't want to. So that's where it started. And then my fitness journey kind of started shortly after that. But it was kind of in spite of a, I walked into a really abusive relationship um, to the point where I was within moments of my life. And for some reason, something I said broke the tension and I was able to run out and I never saw him again. After that, my sticker to him was that he wanted to be a personal trainer. I was like, I'm going to go do it. And that changed my life. You know, learning about the body, learning about how it works. I mean, if there's any journey in life that you need to be doing, it's figuring out how this thing works. This is the most intelligent, like artificial intelligent, whatever it is, bio, whatever it is. There's so much in here that we don't know yet. And uh, the more I dug into that, the more I started realizing why I'd made some of the decisions that I'd made in life, why I was breaking relationships, why I felt like I was always been abandoned and why I was sabotaging myself by overgiving to others just because I was looking at love as like a barter system. If I sacrifice all of these things for you, my time, my energy, um, I will work myself to the bone. I will do all of these things. I will say yes to things normally people say no to. All If I do all that, you have to love me, right? It doesn't work that way. And this entire journey, like that is literally like cliff notes to the whole program. <laughs> Wow. But I mean, that that's kind of where we, where I got started with the fitness journey. It started somewhere deep inside my home heart. Essentially speaking, my mother was incredibly overweight. Um, she was also somebody who was a victim of sexual abuse, rip, like repeatedly throughout her life. Not a really great relationship with her family. In fact, I mean, the people who would be offended by me saying this are no longer living. So I guess I'll just say it. But my mom's mom was married to her ex-boyfriend my mom's ex-boyfriend because my mom dated older men and then he, he got with my mom's mom and then married 
And then that was what happened. And then the tragedy even keeps going further because when I moved to San Diego in 2011, mind you, after my mom passed away, I lost contact with my biological grandmother from my mom's side. Um, they moved away. They couldn't handle it, whatever. She had MS and, you know, a little bit of schizophrenia, all these like traumatic mental issues that she needed to be on medication. Well, that same ex-boyfriend that married him took her off in the middle of nowhere and stopped giving her her meds and isolated in her house for years to the point where when they finally figured out what was going on, um, his children were worried, waited till he left, went into the home and, and basically had to rescue her. She spent the next year in a hospital because as soon as they went in, the doctor told her, this is going to be a long recovery if she makes it. And she died as I was moving to San Diego. So I'm like, at some level here, like there's got to be a reason for all of this stuff. I, I would not, this is nothing that's under my control. So it can't be anything that I'm going to woe is me about. Oh, I'm so depressed. I can't control any of these things. So all I can do is kind of sit here and try to learn from them. And that's what I do with my whole career, my whole life, everything with my business. I don't know. Where do you want to start? <laughs> yeah, I mean, no, I, I mean, listen, there's, that's a, that's, this is like a four parter for crying out loud. Like, I mean, there's you, there's, I don't know, 15, 20 reasons that you've mentioned that you, none of this should have worked out for you. Right. Like there's, I mean, you shouldn't even be here. Like, I mean, you shouldn't even, we shouldn't even be talking right now. So I, I wonder there had to have been some sort of counseling involved in all this. There had to have been, right. You did this all on your own. Yes. Oh my Lord, have mercy. I had this conversation with somebody yesterday, actually. And they said, you seem like, oh, because they're a psych major. <laughs> and I was talking to them, I was like, oh, you're a psych major. That means you're an analyzer. Okay, I'll pay attention then. Because you have to be careful when you talk with talk with analyzers because you're just saying what you want to say, but they're picking up on all the subliminal things that are going on. So I was like, okay, I get it. I know, I do it. Um, but I told him, I was like, He's like, it sounds like you've done a lot of work. You must have spent some time with them. I'm like, no, I haven't. And a lot of that has to do with another core value from childhood. See, my family is not religious necessarily. Like they don't go to church every day, but they, they're, we're French Roman Catholic culture. So what we don't realize is even though we may not be going to church every Sunday, your core values into how you carry yourself into the world, your pride, your, you know, everything. That is still something that you live by. And sure. for us, you never showed anybody pain. Don't show anybody your weaknesses that you can't do that. You must be strong. Deal with all of your stuff internally and move on from there. What that also meant is that we could not deal with things with each other either. There were several years upon years upon years. I mean, there's been, I don't know how many emails I sent to my dad in my like mid twenties where I was apologizing for being such an awful teenager. <laughs> But even still, like we're still continuing to build that relationship. Um, I don't know. I lost my train of thought. That oh, is the stuff. Yeah. So yeah, so no, a lot of it's internal. Yeah. Um, it's not easy, but I think I was built for this, and I don't think that I could necessarily say that therapy would be good for me because I have a hard time trusting other people's intentions. Sure. And that comes from me having a lot of abandonment in my life. Yeah. I trust myself more than anything. And the more I follow this journey, the more I realize that my own intuition is my true healer. So that's what I follow. Well, it's my world, my reality. If anybody disagrees, they don't have to stick around. <laughs> I, who's going to argue the story? I, yes. As a side note, I have a double master's in psychiatry and psychology. So that, so Why you pick up the questions? <laughs> I, I'm just saying, so a lot of it, a lot of that is naturally like you sit there and you go, that sounds like, a counselor put in work, like you both put in work and you're saying that that never happened, not one time, which makes it even a more incredible story. And that you had the wherewithal and the sort of, you know, psychological wherewithal to sort of go, no, I think this is the way it's supposed to go. And this is how I can do this feeling. And that's how I can do that and compartmentalize things and put things in a spot. I'm not going to give that much too much time. And I'm really going to think about this. And those are things. There that, was a lot of books though. So I guess you could call the my therapist books. Well, self-help. Well, yeah. Um, my favorite, favorite, favorite book. I recommend it to everybody. I just loaned out my re my copy today is uh, The Untethered Soul by Michael Singer. Yeah. I mean, if you're looking for a way to calm your mind and get focused, yeah. 
Oh my goodness. That book puts it so clearly, simply, humbly. It doesn't attack you. It doesn't attack your values. And it just simply does kind of what I do on a daily basis with my clients is I give you situational examples. Yeah. I like to take the person's problem, yep. see the similarity in it, take their mind out and give them a third party explanation for that. Yep. And then when we get the point and they understand this makes sense, ah, do you see how this makes sense here too now though? And so then that, we wake by, up. By that rationale, can, because there is a connection, there has to be. I'm going on an enormous limb by saying that. Take me, connect these two things. Connect your personal counseling that you did in yourself, that mental toughness that you acquired by really no choice of your own to, <laughs> to no, no, you're good So connect that, connect that to what you, to what happens now, because being in the shape that you're in doing what you do, people tell me all the time. Yes. It's a, it's physical. It's probably more mental than anything else. So that mental toughness of, I am going to weigh food. I am going to work this out. I am going to do it that way. I look amazing. Like, those two, you're like your mind. I said this on a, on a previous podcast, but you're the same way. You, all of your mental knives are really sharp. Like you spent years just grinding those down to such a point where it hurts. It's so sharp. I don't think that I have any greater ability than others to do so. I think that my gift was that I had to do it earlier than most. But that's harder. That's okay. But we're the it, most dormant when we're children. We're the most forgiving when we're children. Yes. But you also had a shit ton of responsibility dumped on you. Yeah. I mean, taking care of a mom that's th is dying. I mean, that's not like she's sick. She's kind of sick. She has a flu. No, 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 no. She's I mean, dying. that that's hard for a seven-year-old. I mean, I, I, um, I clearly remember the day she passed away, too. And I held guilt from that for a long time because... And this is how much I have yeah. to, like, I have to put the gravity of this into perspective for myself because I kind of, I'm so used to feeling these things that it yeah. doesn't seem like I give myself enough credit for having to deal with it. I would 10 agree. years old, my dad woke me up. He's like, hey, I don't think you should go to school today. I don't think she's going to make it. We already knew she was on hospice. She was like, we had the, the day bed and all of the equipment, the oxygen tank was at home. And he's like, I don't think she's going to last the day. I think you should stay home. And I sat there in his bedroom on the edge of the bed, looked at him and all, I just, I said, I can't do this. I don't think I can handle it. And what an adult thing to say from a young child, but my, th I can't remember specifics, but I do remember, I was like, this is too much for me, too much for my brain to handle. That little I brain. Be here. But what I remember about it and what made me feel guilty was that music has always been my savior. My grandmother, I was supposed to be a music teacher for the first half of my life. And I played clarinet, alto sax, piano, mallet percussion, drums. I didn't, that story goes on too. But um, that's what I dove into. And I was, at the time I was learning clarinet. And I just remember thinking that I didn't want to miss that class. Yeah. yeah. And I don't remember anything from that day, but I do remember getting out of school and I do remember putting my clarinet on the ground and my grandmother telling me that, hey, I have something to tell you. And I already knew. She's like, she passed this morning. And I said, okay. And he, she's like, she's not in pain anymore. And she kept trying to give me all of the things that you try to give a child when their mother passed. And I just couldn't respond. I couldn't cry. I just felt relieved because I had been by her side for the last three years. And here I knew she didn't hurt anymore. I didn't cry until I saw my dad cry. Then I was like, oh, great. I got another one I'm going to deal with right now. <laughs> because it, he's got such a strong archetypal, like, he's such a strong man. He's had to do so much. He's had to overcome so much. And he still lives with that kind of pain every single day just because it wore on his body through the years. He's still a machinist. He's still, he just recently retired. I think now he's moving out here to, to Arizona. So I'm excited to have him closer. But yeah. Yeah. Wow. I don't, I don't, I can't imagine what that's like at seven through 10. That's such, those are such formative years, right? Like 
That's I mean, you got this little brain, and I'm I can I understand why you would go. I I just honestly I I can't fit it in here. I I, I don't know what to do with it, so I'm rejecting it right now. I don't know how else to say it, but that is such formative. I mean. I have an eight-year-old. That's my youngest. And he wants to go outside and play basketball and run. And like to take care of me, I'm like, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how you do it. I don't know how you did it. Yeah, my husband has kids. And like I didn't really truly get the perspective of what that meant because yeah. I've always had to be this way. That's just just that's just me. But when I start seeing children around the same age, yeah. I'm like, wow, that's how it was supposed to be. Okay. Or that's what most people deal with. I'm like, whoa, okay. Well, I guess that means I'm gifted. And what a way, like nobody would hear that story and expect me to say that I'm gifted. You're, you're but I feel as if I was gifted because, you know, when I won my pro card, I, I kind of connect to a higher thing often for all intents and purposes, however that translates to people. And about three days before my pro card, I was kind of in the car. I, I travel a lot around when I do the kitchen stuff. And I just wanted to talk. I wanted to type, but I was like, talk. So I just talked. And I posted it twice now on my Instagram. And every time I listen to this recording, it just inspires me because I don't remember saying those things. I don't feel attachment to the words when I speak. I just speak and they come out. But the message of that was that failure is your teacher. Failure is telling you to get up and find a different way because mm -hmm. what's the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over again, getting the same result and expecting a different thing to happen. But failure is your teacher. People give up too soon. You know, they give up on a marriage. They give up on their dream of owning a home. They give up on that dream job when they were a kid. When I was a kid, I wanted to be a music teacher. Why did I want to be a music teacher? Because I got to connect with kids. I got to show them how I coped with life. Yeah, that was what spoke to me about it. And now I still do that same thing, but through yeah. fitness, because I understand that the framework is key. Now we move into a little bit how I connected that to what I'm doing right now in my life. Okay. It is incredible how much I've learned about the female body. In the beginning of 2020, I took on female like weight loss because I was so sick and tired of dude freaking taking out a soda a week, losing 10 pounds, girl taking soda out a week and like gaining five. It made no sense to me. So I was like, there's gotta be a reason why. So I started looking up hormones and why they are different. Clearly that's one of the major differences that characterizes us between each other. We start as the same and diversify into what we become. Um, and it's just, it's interesting that what we're taught about our bodies is wrong. So wrong. Continue. We are completely disengaging the mind. We are completely disengaging or disregarding the idea that stress and cortisol, they almost had it when they gave us the cortisol, but they tried to use it to sell it to us. And that is not the way it needs to be done. Case in point, if anybody needs to hear this right now, you can go to the gym, you can do a thousand hours of cardio, you can eat the cleanest diet in the world, you can exercise and be the heaviest lifter. If your mind is not right, you are going to get sick. This is how it is. Cortisol raises, blood sugar is available. Why is cortisol there? Cortisol is there as a stress response, as a fight or flight stress response. Right. Now, back when we didn't have massive stressors every moment of the day, yeah. we had enough time to go replenish our mineral stores like magnesium. That was the yeah. key. Magnesium is the key. And you would have time to replenish those stores and you would be good again. But except for your biological 3D human body doesn't understand that your elevated mindset now that we're evolved thinks that a bear chasing you in the woods is your car, your bills, your kids, your relationship, your career path, your self-worth, your friendships. Everything is here to put your cortisol way up. You have to combat that yeah. because you're going to get sick. Why? When blood sugar comes up, that means sugar cravings go up. Hey, quick, I need more energy. I need more energy because we're going to run out soon because you're so you're so stressed. What are you reaching for? Sugar. You're reaching for high concentrated sugar things. And what does that do to your body? Gluten, dairy, excess salt, excess sugar. You create digestive inflammation. And now, just like if I would have gone out on the 
on my skateboard or something. I don't have one because I would never do that. I don't feel but <laughs> if I, do a skateboard, I would clearly fall, hit my wrist, and you would expect that if I hit my wrist on the sidewalk that you'd see a little bump afterwards and there would be swelling. You're familiar with how that, that squishiness feels. Oh, yeah. I remember the last time you ate a whole tub of ice cream. How did your stomach feel? Same way. Yeah. Your digestive system is just like any other tissue in your body. If you give it something that's going to inflame it, you're going to gain water. That's why when we binge on a weekend, we gain five, 10 pounds and we beat ourselves up because, oh my God, I just lost that weight. It's not body fat. Don't get freaked out. It's water. It can go away. But if you leave it there too long, it's going to accumulate into body fat. So get on it. You know, um, I forgot the train of thought here. It, regardless, your mind has to be right. Your mind has to be right. <laughs> I don't know yes, what my thought was. Yeah, no, 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 no. And I, and I and I get that. And a lot of times, a lot of people that I that I will talk about, and you're saying the same thing, more than 75% of what you do is is mental. Mm -hmm. Is is it it totally is because your mind's not right. The body's almost the easy part. It, it really is. Oh my gosh, it really is. Because I told somebody once, my body didn't change until my mind did. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Because yes. My perception of my insecurities, my perception of my abandonment was self-sabotaging in what I was eating, how I was behaving, and how I physically carried my body. Right, right. I see people now and I tell them, it's sad for me to try to go out into the world when we're having a hard time because I see everything. I analyze bodies for a living, right? So when they come in, I check out and I, I see their check-in photo yep. and I start to analyze where water retention is, where body fat is, where muscle needs to be built, where alignment needs to happen. But then as I get to know these people, I I do tarot too. So every now and then I pull out my cards and I just blow their mind. It's fun. Um, so when we get in there and I get to know these people, I start understanding why their body is like, they're like this all the time because they're always at their desk. Cause they're stressed yeah. all the time. You know what I mean? Maybe they hold their self down this way and they have their, they always look to the ground because right. they're so ashamed of something they've done or they feel so insecure about things that they've done. So I go out and I walk into regular public. People don't think that we see this, <laughs> but when you awake to it, when you, when you're healed, when yeah. you're whole, all you can do is look around and try to save people. And that's, do you feel like you, f do you feel that way because of your past? And absolutely, because I can tell you right now, I know what my mom's diet was. I have journals where she's talking about eating pintas and beans from Taco Bell and complaining about it being 10 cents more than it was. I know that she had a problem with food. I know she had massive, massive mental depression. Wow. She was incredibly OCD. Um, four was the number. She could never have any odd numbers. It always had to be even numbers. Um, with those giant buckets of like, um, laundry detergent that you buy from yeah. whatever, like the big tubs, yeah. she would Velcro a Sharpie to it. And every time you took a scoop out, you had to mark it because she needed to know exactly how many scoops that she got from that tub. Wow. Now you being a double psych major and understanding the dynamics of a hyper like OCD personality, can you understand how much pain and trauma she was suffering from I, in conjunction with her cancer? Yeah. I believe yeah. those created her cancer. That's my I, belief. I, I think I, your mind can create your health issues. Your mind can create your high, high blood pressure, your stress, your, it, you deciding that you're not going to speak your truth can cause thyroid cancer. I have proof. One of my clients has no parathyroid or thyroid. And then we were almost on a two year journey now where she's almost completely healed and healthy because one of the things, the core thing that she needed to learn was that she can't give herself to everybody. No. Right. Yeah. No, you cannot. Unless she gives to herself first. A hundred percent agreed with you. I think that going back to your mom's, story that you just told about that i think that your mom unfortunately and I, she was a complete prisoner in her own mind absolutely she was the warden mm -hmm. she was the she was the guard she was the prisoner she was everything yeah and she confided in me a lot too what's interesting is that because my sister had such a hard time my mom was my sister's confidant yeah i was my mom's and so there were things she told me. I remember too, because you know, cancer and weed kind of go hand in hand. It was illegal back then, but my dad found a way for her. 
And I would sit on the back porch while she'd smoke her weed. And I would just sit there and laugh and play. And she would tell me, you know what, you're acting like you're the one who's high. And she would laugh. And I just, that made me feel so good to just be around her and be that for her. So I, I mean, she had another confidant too. And I don't know if I, I'm okay sharing this part of my story, but if you're interested, there's, it gets better. Yeah. Share, please. So my mom was actually bisexual. Um, she did enjoy both. Not that that was ever anything that I'm aware of was a, was an active conversation in their marriage. However, when she got sick, what I am told, and this is what I believe now, she told my father that she understood that the, there were no longer things that she could satisfy with him, his needs. And she told him to find somebody if he needed it and that she wouldn't blame him for that because she understood that he had needs. She, I'm sorry, he never, never did, but she had a really good friend. Her name was Geneva. Um, I'm hoping to find her sometime and, and, and connect with her again. And Geneva was a big part of our life when she was sick. When we would get up in the morning and she, my mom, we'd get into the, we had one of those like vans that everybody thinks are like child molester vans. Yeah. <laughs> like those big white weird ones. <laughs> yeah, with the gold stripe down the side, that 70s yeah. show style. Yeah, that was what yeah. we wrote it. We were, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, she would be in the front and I'd be in the middle seat, my sister would be in the back. And every corner we turn, I just remember her having the plastic Tupperware bowl because of the chemo there. She's throwing up every time. No. But the first place that we would take her or go is, was Geneva's house. And she would spend the whole day with her. Then he dropped me and my sister off at my grandmother's and then he'd go to work. And then he'd do the same thing. He'd come back, pick me up and then um, pick my mom up. And then we would go home. Geneva was her girlfriend. My dad wanted her to have, and excuse me if I get a little emotional. No, no. As much love in her life because he knew she didn't have it for so long. Wow. So to the day that she died, Geneva was right there and they got to spend two years falling in love with each other. Wow. That's a kind of a beautiful thing. I know people are going to sit there and go, that's weird, but it's really, it's really beautiful that your parents sort of knew each other that way where they can go. I'm not selfish enough to go. I need, I have needs. I got to go like as a man, I got needs and he didn't need well, that. Here's the caveat to that as well. When my mom and my dad were dating, she stopped taking her birth control and did not inform him. So hi, I was at the wedding. And one thing that I had to learn over the years, and it was a little hard pill to swallow because my dad's remarried now, Yeah, um, was that he never got a chance to choose to love my mom. He was forced to love my mom because he's a good man, because he was upright. He understood sure. that there was responsibility here. There was a life to take care of here. And he even admitted to me, you know, in one of the times that we were mending, that he wasn't ready to be a dad. He didn't know what the hell he was doing. And now he was taking on my mom who was pregnant with all of these issues already and a six-year-old little girl who was getting molested by her father. Yeah, that's, I mean, talk about not, no one's ready for parenthood. There's no manual, right? But this- and then imagine 10 years after this, you're left with both of the kids and she's gone. Okay. Now that's sad and that's hard. That's what I'm telling you, my yeah. dad- so strong and he's just I've only ever seen him cry maybe twice and the second time that I saw him cry and I hope my stepmom sees this is that there was a time where he started the current lady that he's with now um, he had dated her and they had separated for a little bit for whatever reason they had a disagreement I don't know what it was but I remember going into my dad's room and he was just like in bed crying and I'm like who the heck is this, this is not my dad and it made me want to cry because the last time I saw him cry was the day my mom died Oosh. And I was like, holy hell. And I came in, I was like, are you going to be okay? And he's like, I'm just really sad. I miss her. And uh, they got back together. Obviously, they got married and they're happily living their retirement life together. But over the years, you know, I, and I had my own falling out with stepmom too. So that's what I said. I hope she hears this because we've had our problems as well. Yeah. And she never forced herself on me. But at the same time, this, look, a, a, a female from like 18 to 25. We're going to rebel against somebody. She was there, <laughs> you know, um, but there were things I needed to heal too. But anyways, he gets to choose to love her because when they went on their honeymoon, yeah, he spent 
they okay he has a trike he's a little odd character you know what a trike is oh yeah okay but his is a front wheel chopper trike and it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's badass <laughs> um they drove that to canada for two weeks and they would oh. camp and then they would go to a hotel when they wanted didn't want to camp no more but to prepare for that my dad is a he knows every, being a machinist he got to do all the details right right he's two weeks just laying everything out on the lawn, making sure he had everything, perfecting that. And I saw how much he loved her. I said, he never did that kind of stuff for my mom. Not that I blame him for that, but because he didn't have it and he didn't get the choice to choose. He was just forced because of the situation. So I got to see the different dynamic of how to love somebody through compassion and empathy and sacrifice yeah. and how to love somebody through the intention of true love. Yeah. They both have a purpose. It just be aware of where you're at and what your purpose is in the moment. Well, and, and things change. Yeah. He, and he was an obviously honorable enough man to go, okay, I might not have signed up for the kids and my sick wife and all of this, but I'm not ditching anybody. Right. I'm not leaving. He could have easily left us. That's what I'm saying. Well, I mean, and, and I, I would have ended up in foster care. Yeah, my oh. mom would have been, you know, in hospice and some kind of like, to be honest with you, a lot of the reason that she didn't do too well is because we were poor and we didn't have proper care. Um, yeah, you're right. I wasn't, I'm not supposed to have made it this far. <laughs> no. And I, I don't know how there's not a book here writ in progress somewhere. Uh, I, I, I don't know. Told you I, said. I was like, I, people, people always tell me you need to write a book because these are just honestly sections. This is the early section of my life. Let's not even talk about the time where I was in the abusive relationship and what I had to learn when I had to learn how to speak again. Because I was with this guy for two years and he had me so terrified of who I was that I just didn't want to say anything because I didn't know what to say. Because every time I said something, I got in trouble for it. And then I had to distance myself from that. And then I became independent. I became, there was a period in my life where I was doing the party girl thing, just like everybody does. But there was also a period of time where I got to, I think it was right about the time I turned 30 that I was like, okay, I'm not happy doing this every day. There's no. more, you no. know, and, and moving on through that and then getting into the journey of moving to Phoenix. And this has been an amazing journey. I quit my restaurant job to go head first into a business and be an entrepreneur with my husband. Here we are three years later in our own studio and he's in Vegas right now um, doing a, a show with one of our clients that I think is probably going to win the show and get gain us more exposure and that's our model and that's what we do but i mean man you gotta take risks in life you're you gotta, you're, you gotta to be, you're not supposed to be out here and do all this i mean this is crazy this is insane i i like i hear a lot of stories this one i i, I don't even yeah the the odds like i'm tongue-tied the odds are <laughs> slim slim that you would have made it out of that childhood yeah and the fun part about that is, and what I'm telling you, this is perfect timing. So this week, um, my dad, he sold the property, right? Yeah. My sister, who I haven't talked to in like four years, um, we split after, oh, that that's another chapter. The grandparents passed away. That was another awful situation, but whatever. Um, when my grandmother passed away, we really broke because we were so disconnected from each other. And I was just so resentful of how she was able to process emotion for somebody that was like the only maternal figure I had in my life right. that I just got real nasty. And I just thought, I don't want to deal with you anymore. And I stopped talking to her. And uh, that just kind of continued. Well, when he sold the land, she went back. She lives about 20 minutes or no, not 20 minutes, about an hour North of Bakersfield and Visalia. So she went back to say goodbye to the house. And what was interesting about that is, my dad reached out to me, told me she changed and that I should probably talk to her. I said, I've been thinking about it because she's been on my mind. I did reach out to her. And once we started talking again, I said, yeah, I miss those times too. When we were kids, we started talking about the good times that we had together. And I said, it was hard, but it was good. And she's like, that's so funny that you say that those were the best years of my life. And I was like, wow, of course it was. The time that she had with her dad, she was being raped. The time that she had after she left, she was being raped. She was being isolated. She was, you know, getting on. She's right now on a lot of psychomedic, um, like psycho meds on top of a lot of other things. She's, her body has really taken a beating from all of this over the years. 
And this is what I do. I feel like a lot of the, the things that she's dealing with right now physically are because of the mental trauma. She's yeah. told me her and I both can't remember a lot from our childhood, but I remember things she doesn't. And she remembers things I don't and our perspective of things and how things work. Yeah. Wow. He is a historian. Thank God. Cause I am not, I'm so scattered. I lose things all the time, but she has drawings that I drew when I was a kid. I used to draw all the time. They scanned it in, saved it. And she's kept it for years. Wow. And some of those drawings I have just recently started talking about just in the last three or four months when I'm connecting to people about symbolism in my life, certain, you know, archetypal things. And I look at all these pictures now, it's lions, serpents, crystal balls, fairies, universe, star. there's a star and a moon and everything that I'm drawing. And now knowing what I know now with tarot and astrology and numerology, and I'm not, I'm going to say it, but. I hate to use this word, but God as well, because I feel like they're all the same. Now that I see that, I'm like, oh, those were breadcrumbs. I left those for myself so that I could find them later and believe that what I know now is true. And it, there's more than that. She just recently, okay, so I'm tatted everywhere, right? Product yeah. of being with my husband, he decorated me. I love it though. I always wanted it. I was just always like, uh, you're never going to get a job if you have all the tattoos and all sure that kind of stuff. So sure. I, when I quit my job, I was like, give me all the tattoos. Yeah, right. Um, I'm, I'm getting this one that I want done. And I'm, it's going to be the first female artist that's worked with me. So I only have this one here, but I want it to kind of wrap around. And so it's going to be a phoenix with a rose on the bottom because I have roses as like my, where's the camera? Roses are my theme. Yeah. But it's kind of like dripping fire off the rose and the phoenix is coming above the rose. I showed my sister. Very cool. Yeah. She's like, cool. Did don't, you see my recent tattoo? No, 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 don't, no, 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 don't, I don't know. That's not true. She didn't get that tattoo. She didn't know she did not. Hers is a serpent at the bottom. No. With a ring and a phoenix at the top. Are you kidding me? No. You can go to my IG. It's on there right now. The conversation and everything. I screenshotted it because I didn't know. I didn't think anybody would believe me. And I said, I was like, that's so weird. Where did you get that image from? And she's like, it's an image I've kept since childhood. I've always loved it. And it's this digital image back when we had a DOS computer. I said, that looks familiar. She's like, yeah. you've probably seen it. I've had it for years. Now, the only person that had ever seen this, the specific sketch that I, that I chose yeah. was my tattoo artist who I've never met, who I'm talking to on IG. This, this is something some of this stuff, yeah, you're right. You can't make this. This is not like, I mean, that is insane that she has something super similar like that. And things that you, I mean. On that are, same post, she also has a picture I painted her in 2013. In 2013, it was right before my grandma died. And that year I had no money. I was living in San Diego, single, going to college, going working. I had no money. And I felt bad that I couldn't get anybody Christmas presents. Yeah. So, I was like, well, grandma taught me how to craft. She was amazing. So I was like, I'm going to make everybody craft gifts. For my sister, I painted her a picture. And the picture is on my IG. So if you guys are interested, go check it out. Because I put everything up there. It's a crazy story. The picture is, it looks I like remember. an eye. I it has orange and yellow. And then it has blue and waves. And yep. in the very center, there's black. And there's a an universe. And there's little stars and stuff. Yes. And then I remember thinking that when I'd finished that painting, it was missing something. And I just kind of started messing. I was like, oh, God, here we go. If I put black on this corner, I better figure out how it works because it's going to yeah. ruin the whole thing. Yeah. And something about the way it looked when I just laid the paint down, I just kind of did that to see what it would show. Right. Like two little girls. And one of them is a shorter and one of them is a taller. Yes. And the little girl is holding the taller girl's hand and she's pointing to the universe. And I said, I remember feeling like I was showing her that I can help you out of your pain. Just let me go find out. But it's out there. you got to get out of here to go out there. It's better. She still has it. That's, she sends it to me. I, 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 yes. And you're totally right. And I've seen it. And let, as an aside, people that are listening that don't follow her, it's Liz Curtis, L-I-Z-C-U-R-T-I-S <laughs> underscore I-F-B-B pro. That is the Instagram page. She's on there. And if I remember correctly, if I remember what you're talking about, it is on there. It's almost like a, it's like almost like a tunnel, right? And it looks like two little girls holding hands and it like the tunnel turns into like 
almost like a tidal wave. And at the end of that tidal wave is like, yes, there's like stars, there's black, there's like almost like a moon. It, it, and it, it almost, and I didn't realize that you painted that, right? So, I, and that, that's exactly what it looks like. And I, it is looking like someone's going, you're sort of, they're sort of standing in red. I would consider hell pain. Yeah. Thing. In, in the fire, right? Yes. In the fire of the Phoenix. Yes. You will try to find yes. your head. Your that's what it looks like. And it looks like you're, you're, you're telling this person like, it's this way. I can help you. You can see it. That's, that's where beauty is. Let's get out that way. Yeah. I, I remember that. I remember seeing and it. What a beautiful way I think for me to have thought about it in that time is that totally. the only way to do that is to truly find your inner child and respect totally. them and love I mean, them. This is, this is, yeah, this, this whole story. And I, and I, I'll just say this and I hope you're okay with this. I'm putting you on the spot. I, I didn't say I was going to do I didn't say I, was, I said I was not going to do this, but I, I'm going to do this. Okay. You you have to. You have to have a part two at some point. Oh, please. I would love it. Because, <laughs> because there's a lot more that, honestly, I like I told you, I think that the whole reason that I was guided to this profession was to save people from what my mom had to go through, what my sister had to go through. It's such and an what extraordinary I refused to go. Through. Yeah. I mean, it is such an extraordinary story. It, it, it is unlike anything you have ever probably heard. And I, I, I honestly, to people that are listening to the audience, I, I literally, Liz can stop me and she can call me a liar and that's fine. I, I had no idea any of this, right? No. I did not. And this is part a of lot the of people don't until they get close enough to talk to me. But, you know, <clears throat> there's levels to getting to know somebody. For sure. And of course, IG is going to have that big surface level. Yep. And, you know, I do want to say something about that as well, because I feel like a lot of people knock IG for being so destructive in their lives. I would say it's only destructive if you choose it to be destructive. It's a choice. It can be your book. It can be your networking. It can yep. be your connection. If you change those hashtags to enlightenment, love, power, motivation, the people that show up on your feed are going to be the people who are on the same journey. And yep. it can be a collaborative effort for life. However, if you are sitting in your mind and you're thinking about insecurities and you're thinking about all of the things that are just like the dark shadow things that are not a purpose, you're going to be filled with the same thing. And man, I challenge you, check your screen time, add it up. Yeah. How much time did you spend in that world last week? And then talk to me about why you're not where you want to be. This is going to be interesting because after all of that, there's a section in our podcast that we do and it's a 10 question. It's like a 10 question dash. Okay. okay. And this is going to, based on what you've just said for the last 52 minutes, this is going to be very, very interesting. This is a questionnaire. That's a pretty famous questionnaire. I don't think okay. people know much about it. It's an old school questionnaire. I totally ripped it off, but I use it and I'm interested. Okay. People that are listening to this are going to say, John, we cannot wait for this. 10 yard question dash. <laughs> Do they be know what's coming? <laughs> okay, just, go for it. I'll just start. What is your favorite word? Hmm. See? Yeah. That's, you're telling somebody who speaks a that, thousand words to pick one. I, I, you got one. What's your favorite? Light. Very appropriate. What is your least favorite word? Hate. Appropriate. What turns you on creatively, spiritually, emotionally? People. Connection. Mm. Resonance what? with one others. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, again, appropriate. appropriate. <laughs> what, what, what turns you off? Small talk. Yeah. That's, isn't that painful sometimes? It's okay in the beginning, but come on, there's more here. There is more here. This is the favorite question everybody loves. What is your favorite curse word? Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> it's all day, every day. I use it to amplify everything that I say. I mean, if I need it, if I need a qualifier, that's the word. <laughs> you, don't say that. me, you don't care. <laughs> no. People that say that word is their favorite word. I, I always say this in response. It is so flexible that word you can use it for like a million different things i can be excited with it i yes. can be mad with it it's fantastic <laughs> what 
is or what sound or noise do you love? Ooh, the sound of um, harmony, if that makes sense. I like chords. Beautiful. Oh, yeah. Okay, um, acapella stuff. Yep. Yeah, so the, the, the way sounds vibrate together and, and the dynamics of that, that. It's a, it hits your ear perfect. Yeah, and it's cool because I can go any genre with that. What sound or noise do you hate? Silence. Yeah, you don't seem to be the one that can just, that sits very well in quietness for hours. You know what, though? I do it. But you need it. I need it. But yes. it was, I just had this conversation today with somebody. I said, look, I know it's going to be hard to sit there. And because when they tell you to start meditating, they tell you to you just let the thoughts flow. Holy crap, man. Depending on how long you've been bottling that stuff up, it could take months before oh. it's fine. And I didn't know that. But I just kept trying, kept trying, kept trying because I kept reading things that were telling me that it would work. And I'm like, yeah. I don't know. I guess we'll just try. And eventually, once I just sat there and stopped feeding it and yeah. just let it fizzle out, I was like, oh. Yeah, you can breathe. This is what it's like. Yeah. So it is silence, I kind of play music as well when I meditate just because I'm like, <laughs> yeah, too for much, me, there's fear in silence. It's death. Yes, there's there's too much again. silence. Yeah. Too much silence can be scary sometimes where it's like, this is like, this is almost like, you know, when you got kids home that are really, really young and you hear silence and you're like, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> like, why is this all sorts of quiet? Um, exactly. What profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Mm, keynote speaker. Well, you could do that, this whole story. I, so I was going to get there. I was like, either it's motivational speaking or a book or both. I, I was going to say that. So I think you should do that. I enjoy what the work that I'm doing currently. Yeah. However, I know it is the framework for my next step, which totally. probably won't be as totally in detail here with clients. Like, yeah, I'll probably have one-on-one -on -one clients, but I'll probably expand that to be able to do, be more efficient. Totally. I can only reach so many people one-on-one, -on -one, but if I can yeah. reach people in a mass, if I can I get, get those thoughts organized and really make them powerful, my delivery is there. I've always had that. So you, you died. Yeah. keynote speaker, motivational speaker. There's no doubt about that. What profession would you not like to do? A nine to five. Yeah. At a desk. Oof. That's you can't make this thing be still, man. I'm buzzing all the time. I uh, hated sitting at a I was a leasing agent for like six months. I hate it. Yeah, can, I, I can't. Myself. I couldn't be that boss if I was like Liz's boss to go. Liz, it is five to nine. You're late today. You know, dude, don't piss me off. I don't even like you anyway. Yeah, I couldn't do a nine to five at a, at a desk anyway. I can't do that. There's no way. I agree with you 100 percent on that. Yeah. This last question is the one that I have a feeling. I'll just, I'll ask. Okay, you want to see, let's go. <laughs> if, if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? It, oh, that's a hard question to answer from my point of view. That's why heaven I asked that. Now, I don't need to wait. I talk to him now. Okay. He is me and him. We are him. So what do you, what would he How do what, I connect? Huh. Okay, I'm going to get a little weird here. We've all seen The Matrix, right? Yep. And you know when he tells Neo, you have to believe yep. that you are not of this world to be able to fly. Yeah. Isn't that what Jesus did? Wow. Yeah. He would say, well, yeah, well, for sure. He yeah. Water and wine, just like Neo did. He resurrected himself to show you. Now, he only appeared short time, right? He right. died on that cross, and yep. only one person was able to recognize him and then bring the story back, correct? Yep. So how do we, our 3D minds think that he must now be in that same face, but you recognize somebody's spirit and energy is transcendent. No doubt. So with that, he came back and showed that multiple lives are possible. Now let's take that concept one step further. Okay. If God was this big brain, yeah. brains get smarter by doing what? increasing the connections in the synapse correct yeah. yeah so what if every life that you came down for was a pathway to learn lessons so this big brain could learn oh yeah well yeah the 3d world who we are my hair color is orange i am a female i'm wearing a green sweater i'm in a that's all a projection of what i'm supposed to be learning right now yeah so I can take that message to heaven 
to the big brain, to the big source, the light above and say, hey, look what I found out. Send me back in, coach. I'm ready for more. Mm. So right. if heaven exists, it depends. Heaven exists here in a 3D world because we choose to describe it as such. Yeah. But if you always describe it as something that's far away from you, you'll never get there. You can be there today. You can be there right now. Well, Close your eyes. You're there. That because is, it's, it's awesome. just, we had it wrong, man. We yeah. just, we were being too literal. So that there. is, that, <laughs> that of all the, of all the podcasts I've done, that has never been answered that way, but it, it makes so much sense. And I totally get what you're saying. I under, I, I, I totally understand it. Uh, for people that are listening, I don't know. I kind of, I kind of hooked her into part two of this at some point. So there's, I, there's, I would like to do it because all of the podcasts yeah. that I've done and all of the stuff that I've done has usually just been on bodybuilding. Nobody gets to know this stuff. See, this is why I do it. There's everyone's got a story. When we talked initially on the phone and you said, I have, this is really, really good timing. And I didn't know why. And now I know why. And it, it's, it, it is perfect timing. And, uh, I do have you for a part two at some point, which is going to be great because there's a lot of other stuff. I'm sure that you can get into that. we didn't oh, get yeah. it's, it's so hard. It's like, Oh man, this is like a big package to unwrap. Like, where do yeah. I start? <laughs> oh, there's a lot to unpack. This is a huge Amazon box full of stuff. This is big. Um, so was, you know, like I'm an open book. I've always been an open book. That's yeah. kind of how I lead. Even yeah. when I was teaching music and when everything like that, I just, I'm real with people and I tell people exactly how I feel like, Hey, I understand how you might feel because when I had to deal with this, this is how I felt. Yeah. Is that similar? And they're like, yeah, that's exactly how I felt. I just got really good at describing my feelings to people and being open about it. This, this, this is amazing. This journey is sort of chronicled here now. And Part Thank of that you. journey, Thank I think, you so much for being able to put it on camera. <laughs> yeah, well, and part of this journey does begin on on IG. She's at Liz Curtis underscore IFBB Pro. Uh, you can you find it there. Stuff like this. So if you if you like the connection to what I talk about, yes, I tune my IG to that. So if you watch my stories, they're those messages that I get through yeah. there that resonate yeah. with me at some level in some capacity that I've had to deal with in life. Yeah. I project that out, and so I've had multiple people that I don't even work with that reach out to me periodically and say, please keep doing that. You're helping me heal. She's real. Her journey's real. This is, it's painful. It's beautiful. It's, 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 it, I mean, I, th those are two really things that they're, I mean, th that in and of itself, I mean, that story is incredible. Um, I, uh, I know I could do this for another hour for sure. I, I, know that <laughs> I know, but you have other people you got to get, there's more light out there to find you. you there I'll is. Be around. I'll be around. If you, if you let, yeah, it's people stay tuned. This is, this has been great. Liz, I, I, first of all, I cannot thank you enough for taking the time out, sharing your story. I, I really appreciate it. I really, really do. It's, it was, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. It really is. And you're tough. I admire you. I do. Um, I try. You're I doing, heavy to make it look right. <laughs> you're doing the yeoman's work. You are, you're doing it and uh, you're doing it well and job well done thus far. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, I cannot say that meaningfully enough. Um, but, uh, there she is, everybody. That was, uh, that was fantastic. Liz, again, thank you. We will be in touch and, um, I can't thank you enough. Thank you so much for coming on. Absolutely. Anytime. Bye. <laughs>